shifting our narrative around what comfort eating is. Now, with the portion I'm, control, I'm, I'm writing. I'm writing this down. I'm writing this down. Oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Take the notes. I'm writing, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I need them. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna. I'm cheating a little bit, but I have to <laughs> change the eating narrative. I love yes. that. I wanted to pivot really quick. So another thing that I'm very interested that um uh in what you take part in, and this is the reason why I'm a hefty boy myself. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and for me, I have a very hard time. We all just tricked you just to get a free session. Okay. Uh, so th th this is how we do it. I am a comfort eater, mm -hmm. but my thing is is I have a very hard time with portion control. Yes. Mm -hmm. How does someone start the process of maybe, is it like a weaning process? Cold turkey doesn't work for me. No. In anything. In, in anything. Yes. So for someone, for someone like me, who genetically, you know, uh, I, I, I'm from my mother's Puerto Rican side and they're a little more, they're a little more thick on that side. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I, I, I have those genes. Um, how does someone like me that struggles with portion control or someone in the audience that struggles with portion control, do you have any tips for us? Because I feel like I could still emotionally eat, but eat the right stuff, right? I hear you. I hear you there. This is amazing. So, you know, and just for context, right? So I, within therapy, I specialize within eating disorders and disordered eating and body image, body liberation, all of those words. So um, I think that's really helpful that you've asked this question. Now, when it comes to comfort eating, I will say that I take a different approach. And so when I think about comfort eating, I think about that being, that's the food of our ancestors, right? That we've often been yes. disconnected from. Like, even for you, you're talking about having this Italian rich background of like lots of good food, Puerto Rican background. Oh, yeah amazing also very much influenced by black culture you know so like yes deep history right and so there's a reason why you're eating those foods because there's a connection there and so I do this thing where it's like how do I depathologize de or destigmatize my relationship with food in this way that honors that legacy and that history and also honors that like I mean as a part of us having hormones like we we have different cravings we have different things we want you know and so I think Tell me about it right we uh -huh. came back from a trip yesterday and uh my fiance's uh father's lasagna is outrageous yes. and we found out that it got destroyed on the drive i'm an italian american boy but once i found out that the lasagna was destroyed my entire day was ruined yes absolutely so, like i i i, I saw so i 100 agree with everything you're saying so yes. I, I, yeah, so it's true. I need the, the audience to know that this is true. It's very true. Absolutely. And I think like the questions to ask yourself would be, you know, as I'm, as I'm eating this item, you know, what's happening in my body for me? And so you can start to notice like, you know, is this connected to a specific emotion? Am I feeling grief? Am I feeling sadness? Am I feeling joy? And then where is the link between like, how are those things being linked? Why is this lasagna, for example, being mm. linked with, you know, um, a sad experience now that it's gone? Maybe it was happy before. Yeah. <laughs> you know and so it's true really getting into that right and and then so that's the first part with the comfort eating I say you know shifting our narrative around what comfort eating is now with the portion I'm, I'm, I'm writing I'm writing this down I'm writing this okay, down. go ahead go ahead take the notes I'm writing, I'm, I, yeah I, I need them I'm, I'm gonna I'm cheating a little bit but I have to <laughs> change the eating narrative I love yes. that and then with the portion piece I would say this. So oftentimes we find, and you let me know what you let me know how you feel about this based on what you're describing. Do you have this relationship where it's almost like you feel, and I'm just using this term because I hear it a lot with clients, out of control with portions or, um, you know, as if, you know, it's almost like you set out to do one thing and then you're eating more than what you planned on eating, those type of things. That, and I, my thing is, uh, my fiance calls them second dinners. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll eat dinner. Mm -hmm. And then throughout the night, I'll know that the food is there. Yes. And it's almost like I get abducted by aliens. Like, I don't even remember the process of like heating it up. I do, mm -hmm. but I suppress it. Like, yes. I know I'm not supposed yes. to be eating it. So I'm suppressing it and mm -hmm. just being like, oh, I don't know. It just happened. Like, I just ate it. Like, like it was an accident. Like a magician, like put the food into my stomach. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, and I feel that just growing up, our portions were huge because my dad cooked for an army. 
Yes. So my dad would literally like put food on the table and it was like survival of the fittest, like get what yes. you can now before yes. it's all gone. Yes. And I've never gotten rid of that eating mindset. There you go. And and my my father would be uh more more my mother, but my father would, would hate if we didn't finish food. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Because because they grew up, you know, in a situation where my, my father, my father's father was an Italian immigrant, my mother's mother was a Puerto Rican, uh a Puerto Rican immigrant. Um so they were like they used to have to steal bread to survive absolutely like well, my grandfather was around in like world war ii like watching his like yes. his city get blown up and shit yes exactly so he used to make them finish all their food and if they didn't i'm sure you could guess what happens and yes. then you, so they kind of that trickled down generationally generations to us and I feel bad if food is not finished. Like if I see food out, it needs to be gone. It's so crazy. That makes so much sense. So you, when you're talking about it, reminded me of the study that might be helpful. So there was a study done on mice um, and it was really to examine like food relationship. And so they would starve the mice, you know how we do experiments here, starve the mice. And then they would um, study the offspring of those mice. And so the offspring of those mice also dealt with um, malnutrition and starvation, despite never being starved. And then this passed down like two generations forward. So what you're referring to is like, you know, where you've experienced this starvation and this um, deprivation with food. And then, you know, it's just inherited, you know, generationally through like that biology. And so for you, it's like, you know, you have this meal and now you're still operating out of the trauma of your great grandfather or your grandfather and thinking like, there's not enough, even though you currently live in a state of abundance, you know, where you can probably get. Oh my God. Yeah. Right. Any, any time so, of night I'm in New, I'm in New York, so you can get it. Oh yeah. You can literally <laughs> get a newborn. You can get a newborn baby on Postmates. So, like, exactly. If you want to. exactly. It's just like, <laughs> <laughs> exactly that. Right. And so that's yeah. the thing. And so I think like what it is, is this inherited pattern that's become embodied for you um, or for people that deal with this going into the body and working with the body to, you know, create safety and release that pattern around like, we're no longer in survival mode anymore. Like your body goes into that fight, fight, freeze and letting know it's not yes. in survival anymore. And so that's one thing. And just one more thing here around this is that overall, like we have this culture that's really big in diet culture. I don't know if you all have heard of diet culture, but this culture based yes. in friction and, you know, um, the slim ideal and thinness and all this stuff. And because of that, we, you know, often monitor ourselves very heavily. We might restrict food. We might forget to eat because we're working and all of these things. And so what often happens with our bodies is that in response to any, you know, state of restriction, we then go into the opposite side of that and might do what some people might label as overeating or binge eating, you know, in response to that starvation. And over time, you know, starvation and dieting does actually lead to long term weight gain of course the you know diet industry is not going to tell you that but you know it does right. you're restricting and then having these like um these cycles of then going into like the eating binging or overeating or just eating to nourish your body in the way it needs in that moment so yeah, yeah. it's layered for sure my thing is i'm a big fan of blood tests now yes if the blood test says i'm doing good that means yep. i could keep doing what i'm doing Yep. Now, if the blood test says I'm not doing well, then we got to change some things. I'm yes. very scientific. I'm very science based when it comes to a lot of things. So yes. I go to my doctor like every like four months, three months and get my blood taken. And then I'm like, OK, so we're doing something right. Let's stick with this. I yes. used to go to the I used to go to the doctor and say, oh, I'm good now. Now I'm going to eat whatever I want. Yes. You know, I can mm -hmm. you, you have to keep it. And uh, again, my fiance is always like, you have to eat normal. You can't just do a crash diet because you, you, it's not going to be good for your body. And you're just going to end up where you were three months ago. And you Absolutely. did all that work because you wanted to do this weird diet. Exactly. If, if I ate less, I'd be in a lot better shape. No pun intended. Yes. So that's like the hardest thing for me.